Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Grace Telesco, and I am from the Fischler College of Education School of Criminal Justice. I am joined by my regular guest on this YouTube channel, uh, Mr. Ed Denzel from the show Unfound. It's a podcast that Ed is the host of. Um, Ed is a dear friend, a uh, colleague, and uh, we just love him. We, we had to take a, a month off because we had some other programming that was just, we weren't able to get our schedules uh, together for that for January. But it feels like I've, I don't know, it just, I feel like I've missed you like tremendously. Yeah. Like, you yeah, know, I forgot what you look boy. like yes. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. But um, we've been, we've been doing this now for several years. Um, Ed has come down to Florida, to uh, Fort Lauderdale rather. Um, and has done a class in person for us that was really well received anatomy of missing person, uh, missing person case. And, um, and so we're back with our regular, uh, regular scheduled programming. And tonight is a really interesting case that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be exploring and examining. Um, but let me, but let me just give a little bit for those viewers who may not know who Ed is. Ed is a journalist. He uh, is a filmmaker uh, screenwriter. He's just uh, an extraordinary uh, human being, and he's now dedicated his life to um, to giving voice to the missing, uh, to those who have been um, missing and unfound, right? So, um, and may maybe, Ed, you can just start off just a little bit with um, your regular programming, you can talk a little bit about that so that our viewers can know up front, and then we'll do another plug at the end. Um, sure. And then you can talk about this, uh, this very, very fascinating case uh, that you've selected to talk about tonight. Okay, great. Good to be with you, Dr. Telesco. Uh, once again here, first time in 2022. It does seem like it's been a while, and actually it has been a while because this is probably the longest span uh, we've had where we haven't had a show together. Uh, you know, I know we didn't do one in January. I know we didn't do one in December. In December, I don't, I'm not sure if I can remember if we did one in November or not. So maybe the last time we've actually spoken about disappearances was when I would, was down there on November 4th of 2021. And that was uh, a good time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, been doing this program since September of 2016. Uh, we've covered about 240 disappearances now which is a crazy number. Uh, the program uh, continues to be very popular, uh, continues to have more and more downloads uh, every month. I mean, uh, 2021 was a huge year in the downloads department for Unfound, and it's continued into 2022. Everybody who knows the program knows that I do not do this alone. I uh, have assistants who help me, um, Emily, uh, Sheree, Heather, Carrie, and Eric, and they do have their all, all their jobs. They are volunteers, and I rely on them heavily uh, to do all of the things that Unfound does between the podcast and the YouTube channel and the speaking engagements and everything else. And probably the most exciting thing that has happened recently is that uh, Unfound is now part of Spotify. I just signed a contract uh, for the next year where they will be hosting uh, the program. They approached me. They found out about Unfound and decided that they wanted uh, Unfound to be part of their true crime uh, library, I guess you might call it. So that just happened within the last few days. So um, are we ready to talk about the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley, Dr. Telesco? Are we ready to do that? Yes, we okay. are. Very good. And uh, for the anybody who's watching, um, Dr. Telesco will be posting some pictures and things. So you won't be able to see me, but you will hear me as I go through the facts and about the disappearance and what has gone on since the disappearance uh, occurred in, way back in 1953. And we also have, I think, uh, some pictures of the house, the window, uh, a couple maps of the neighborhood that I think everybody uh, will find helpful. So this is the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley. This is a disappearance that uh, we covered on Unfound back in, must have been the fall of 2018, so over three years ago. And I have to give a shout out to the guest for that episode. He, has, he runs a great blog. His name is Anthony, crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. 
Uh, he holds the record for the most appearances on Unfound, and he was the guest for this episode. He has become an expert on Evelyn's uh, disappearance. And I, for, so for a lot of this, a lot of this information we'll be talking about tonight comes from him, a, including at least a few of the pictures that you're going to see tonight. So I urge you, uh, given that there's so much information for Evelyn's uh, disappearance, we're going to hit the most major points in the next hour. But uh, to read uh, a really good true crime blog, you should go to crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. So Evelyn went missing on October 24th, 1980, uh, 1953. This is a, a kind of important to me. My, my deceased mother's birthday was October 25th. So this was the day before she turned 13. So that's how long ago it was. We're looking at a disappearance that is uh, over 68 years old. It's the second oldest disappearance we've covered on Unfound. From La Crosse, Wisconsin, and she was 15 years old at the time. As Dr. Telesco uh, mentioned, uh, we picked this one out for the reason that just back in October, Dr. Telesco and I had uh, covered what we now know is the murder of Janelle Matthews, uh, a girl from Greeley, Colorado, who was abducted from her home in 1984. Well, Janelle's murder, we now know it's a murder, although it's still un we're still unsure who did it, is very similar to the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley. And so I'm hoping that by watching this tonight, you'll be able to watch this, maybe go back to that show we did back in, I believe, October, of 2021 and compare and contrast and see how two disappearances can be very much like each other in some ways, but be very different in others. And uh, as all of you know, who have uh, watched our previous shows, or if you are new to watching uh, me being a guest on Dr. Telesco's show, I'd like to bring out some points to think about as I am going to go through the facts. These are maybe three questions that should be going through your mind, and we will try to answer them, talk about them once I go through uh, all the facts of the disappearance. Number one, was Evelyn targeted or was she just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Number two, why would the perpetrator of this disappearance, the main suspect or suspects, go out the way he or they came in with Evelyn? And you'll see what I mean once we get to that part and uh, Dr. Telesco will have a picture to show you. And number three, given that this disappearance is so old, how would this disappearance be different in the 21st century? Not just how somebody might go about causing a disappearance like this, but the investigation of the disappearance itself, all the additional information we would have in the 21st century, century for a disappearance such as this one, because disappearances like this still happen in the 21st century. So the facts are these. Evelyn was babysitting for the Rasmussens, uh, uh, a couple, and they had just had a baby. So she was over there babysitting their infant. The infant was very, very young. I don't even think it was more than a couple months old. And the Rasmussens were going to a football game, a big homecoming uh, football game at the local high school. And the usual babysitter for the Rasmussens was also going to the game. So the Rasmussens had to find someone else and they found Evelyn Hartley. So she did not disappear from her own house. She disappeared from the Rasmussens house. She, so she is there, it's a Friday night. She brings her schoolwork over. Uh, the baby is in another room. And all she has to do is hang out there. If the baby cries, go take care of the baby and wait for the Rasmussens to come home. Well, and uh, this was not necessarily Evelyn's, uh, it was not like next door. She did not live next door to them. It was uh, a decent, you know, mile or two away from where she actually lived. So Evelyn's father called the Rasmussen house in that, that evening, expecting for Evelyn to pick up the phone. She didn't. He called again, 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 and no, no answer at all. So he got worried, he got in his car, he drove over to the Rasmussen house, and here is what he found. The front door was locked. 
the lights in the house and the radio in the house, remember this is 1953, uh, were on. The baby luckily was unharmed. There is no signs that this baby was you know, taken from the crib or put back. The baby, in fact, is, this uh, baby girl grew up to be a woman. She is still alive. So she was fortunately unharmed in all of this. In fact, we're not even clear if the perpetrator of this disappearance even knew that the baby was there. But the furniture was in disarray as if it had been moved around, kicked around, uh, kind of out of place, not aligned as you might align like a couch with a coffee table, something like that. Her books were strewn. They weren't neatly stacked. It was obvious that whatever happened, somebody came upon her and the books were on the ground or flipped open, just not in the way that we would usually uh, leave books. And one shoe of Evelyn's shoes was in the family room. The other shoe was in the basement of the house. In addition, Evelyn's glasses were found on the floor in the basement and they were broken. Moving on, so of course, when he saw all of this, he calls the police and this investigation begins. So what they also found when, when they went down to the basement is they determined that this perpetrator or perpetrators, plural, broke into the house through an open window that was kind of at ground level that went into the basement, the cellar. There were also signs that it looked like whoever did this had tried to pry open other windows on the house before coming to this one that he was able We'll just take for granted that there was a man that, who did this. This male uh, found a way to open this window and sneak in. But the other basement windows also had pry marks, which I think could mean that this was not something necessarily that was planned. This is somebody who showed up at the house, was just trying to get in, finding any way to do so. There were footprints in the dirt, in the yard, and on the floor of the basement that showed a particular type of shoe, a very unique type of pattern. And we'll talk to, about the shoe in a moment. And what you're looking at right there, uh, the picture that's up on the screen, is a ladder that is the Rasmussen's ladder that was used when the perpetrator left the basement. So he went in through the basement, kind of, I guess, jumped down onto the cellar floor, went up, abducted Evelyn, but brought her back downstairs and went out the same way, did not go out the front door for some reason. Instead, he chose to go up these stairs, this step ladder, out the window, I guess taking her along with him. It seems like the worst of all choices, the most difficult, but that is what happened. They found Evelyn's blood type in the yard. There were obvious blood marks in the yard of the Rasmussen home. And we have to remember, this was not happening at like three in the morning. This was happening in the evening while a high school football game was going on. And we know that generally your average football game maybe starts at 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. So this was happening in the evening on a Friday when people are usually out and about. But there was blood on the basement floor that they determined to be Evelyn's type. Remember, this is many, many years before DNA. And I don't know if they ever have actually tested that blood to make sure it's hers. But of course, it makes the most sense. There was blood on, that was her type on the basement floor. There was blood that was her type that was pulled in the yard. So it seems um, if you were to read some accounts and, uh, and we have several news stories, if you have a newspapers.com uh, account, you can read many, many stories that have been written about Evelyn's disappearance over uh, the past 60 some years. And right there, and if you'll just leave it right there, that's a good uh, place to leave that. Thank you, Dr. Telesco. So what it seems is that this guy had Evelyn, got her out on, into the yard, would carry her a little bit, and then let, you know, maybe rest, put her on the ground, and so that, then there would be blood there. If you go a little farther, blood would be there. And doing this right in a neighborhood, La Crosse, Wisconsin, this was not like a farmhouse. It was on 10 acres of land and the closest to house is a mile away. This is in a neighborhood, uh, houses to both sides of this house, houses across the street, and nobody saw anything. But what you're looking at there is 
uh, the map and you can see how close uh, these houses were. So you see the Rasmussen home and you can see the path that this perpetrator took after abducting Evelyn. Went this circular path, going to the garage, going past these other houses and uh, blood was found smudged on a house 100 feet away. So this would probably be that house in the upper right-hand corner as if he went up against the house, maybe with her, maybe to hide from somebody or stay out of the light. And because of this, the blood got kind of wiped along the wall of this house. And as I stated, this is in a neighborhood where surely some people were home. Police get there, they're doing all this, and they got some dogs. As many of you know, uh, who follow Unfound, know that I'm not the biggest um, believer in dogs. They're not reliable. Uh, they're, they're a tool just like anything else, maybe like a polygraph test. It, they can be wrong, they can be right, but a lot of times dogs uh, do not find missing people, humans do. But these dogs track the scent for a couple blocks. So it seems that this perpetrator was headed in what could be called a, a northeast direction, and he continued to go that direction with Evelyn. And then they got to a spot, the dogs got to a spot where they did not smell the scent anymore. The police hypothesized that this is where this perpetrator's car was parked and that he had put or they put her into this car and took off. No proof of that necessarily. I'll get to that in a moment. For all of you, must all of you must understand though that this is very common. The dogs will track uh, a scent for a while and stop near a road. And oftentimes uh, they infer, police, the handlers infer, well, this is where this person got into a car. I have to tell you, a lot of times it is discovered that that's not what happened at all. Just keep that in mind as you're thinking about Evelyn's. Uh, disappearance. So we have to remember, this guy's carrying Evelyn two blocks in this neighborhood on a Friday night and nobody saw anything. Now there were some witnesses. We don't know uh, if they saw what they thought they saw. We don't know if what they saw had anything to do with the disappearance, but some people did eventually come forward. Uh, there were cars riding around the neighborhood. Uh, some of the neighbors said it seemed like they had not seen these cars before, this car before. It didn't, was not owned by anybody in the neighborhood. And another witness stated that he saw a car with a girl in it with two guys, and she had her head down. But it's, it's hard to say. He could not identify this girl as being Evelyn, could not uh, really describe the two men in the car. It didn't look like... Uh, she was fighting with them or anything like that. For all we know, it was just two guys and a girl riding in a car and having a good time that night, for all we know. But this witness uh, thought that something about it seemed kind of uh, strange. So they're, they're doing this investigation. They do as much uh, 1950s types, uh, type of uh, forensics as they can on the house. Uh, I still don't know... Um, you know, to this day in 2022, whether the DNA or the blood that was found was tested to make sure that it was Evelyn's, or maybe possibly they might have found somebody else's blood type, maybe the perpetrator's blood type, maybe she managed to scratch him or something, and he started to bleed. bleed. Even now, almost 70 years later, there's no information out there about that. But they continued to work the case. And some things were found. Maybe we want to move to the uh, shoe picture uh, right now, Dr. Telesco, if we could. Now, I had mentioned, and there's another map there, those shoes right there. Thank you. These shoes were found uh, quite a ways uh, by themselves, quite a ways from where Evelyn was that night. Um, but the bottom of them does kind of fit the pattern of, the, sh of the, the shoes that were used in this disappearance. So there's still a belief here in 2022 that these could be the shoes of the person who committed this disappearance. In addition, what was found, once again, not close to the home, my understanding was near a highway or under an underpass, something like that, that a pair of brawn panties 
were found uh, and they could have been Evelyn's once again at the time, could not do any DNA testing on it, but there was the possibility. But between Anthony working on this disappearance, me working on this disappearance, there's no news out there that her family, her parents ever looked at these and said, oh yeah, those are hers. There was a jacket found, once again, not close to the house, but there was blood on it. And they were able to determine that the blood on this jean jacket was Evelyn's blood type, not her blood, once again, her blood type. And we know that there's uh, a limited uh, number of blood types, A, B, A, B, O, and then we have positive, negative. So what are the odds that they would find this jacket with blood on it and would be the same blood type as Evelyn's? Once again, I have no idea if in the 21st century that has been tested for DNA as to try to determine if it's actually Evelyn, Evelyn's or not. But the police seem to think that uh, they were fairly convinced that whoever did this to Evelyn, this is this person's jacket. But you must remember, it could be all just coincidental because none of the, these items have been conclusively connected to Evelyn's disappearance. These are just things that were found through searches, people coming forward, hey, I found this, hey, I found that. Moving on. Uh, suspects. There are many, there were many, and uh, I think we might have, uh, I, I think that I sent maybe one or two articles about different suspects um, you know, the, uh, regarding uh, her disappearance. Now, you should know one of them might be a, um, a person some of you have heard of if you are familiar with uh, serial killers. There was a kid, guy, his name was Ed Ginn or Gein, G-E-I-N. He was a serial killer working in that area around that time. And over the years, they've tried to pin Evelyn's disappearance on him unsuccessfully. Now, you should know that Ed uh, was the type of serial killer that we now know exists he liked to brag about a lot of um, murders that he probably did not commit and, and just making up things. So we always have to be leery when a serial killer starts bragging about what he has done. So no proof that he was involved, but they certainly took uh, a long look at him. And there were many other men who were investigated and you can find those articles online and what's, I think, interesting about them is me, none of these guys knew each other, but in each one of them, you could look at that guy and say, oh, well, he was put in jail because he, he harmed uh, a young woman like Evelyn. And you think, oh, he has to be. But then you can look at another one of these suspects and say, well, you know, he was in the area that night, so it has to be him. So it's just not at that easy as, you know, to pick out one of them and determine, oh, yeah, he is the guy that did this. It very well may be that all these people, these men who were interviewed and they were felons and had crimes, violent crimes. It could be that none of them did this to Evelyn. So we have to think about that. And when we get back to the questions uh, that I started this discussion with, we're, you know, we'll get into that a little bit. They all seem like very good suspects, but here almost 70 years later, nothing has been pinned on any of them. And I'm pretty sure that those suspects are not even alive anymore. So that makes things difficult. Moving on, as you've seen, maybe you could just uh, kind of flip through those uh, news articles, Dr. Telesco, if you could put them up on the screen. This is just a sample of all of the articles over the years that have been written about Evelyn's disappearance in Wisconsin. Um, as I was telling uh, Dr. Telesco and her assistant before we started tonight, this of what we might call regular disappearances, this disappearance has gotten more media coverage than any other that I've done. Uh, and in the grand scheme of things, the only disappearance that I've covered that has gotten more media attention than Evelyn's is probably Flight 370, that Malaysian airliner that went missing, what was it, uh, eight years ago now. So of all the individual disappearances that we've covered on Unfound, uh, this has gotten uh, the most. I was able to find articles from the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, 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 the 
the 1970s. Way back, I, there's one article in there where uh, it says in the 1970s, so like 50 years ago, this will probably never be solved. That was what was written 50 years ago. And here we are in 2022. And whoever wrote that is still correct. You can find articles from the 90s. You can find articles from the 2000s, the 2010s. And as I told you, uh, my friend Anthony, who runs the blog crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com, he just covered this on his blog, I'm thinking in 2017, and he did a fantastic job on it. Uh, a lot of writing on it, a lot of pictures, a lot of analysis. So this is a disappearance that still continues to get a lot of attention despite it being this old, as you would probably guess, the disappearance of what we would call just regular people from the 1950s do not continue to get a lot of attention these days. But Evelyn's does, and it's probably because of the circumstances. It's I think that adds a, a, another layer of mystery when a, a girl goes missing from somebody else's house instead of her own, like what happened with Janelle Matthews. You can think about that um, you know, in your own way to see you know, how do you compare and contrast Janelle's and Evelyn's? Most importantly, and looking at NamUs, looking at other um, crimes at the time, there's nothing really like Evelyn's at all. So that also makes things very, very difficult. You can't say, well, there was a serial killer working. Maybe Ed Ginn did this, maybe not. But there's surely no other young women missing from La Crosse, Wisconsin, or that area from the 1950s at all. At all. So that's the disappearance. Now let's go back and take a look at these questions. Uh, maybe Dr. Telesco wants to jump in here a little bit before we uh, start with these questions. And I, I'm sure she and I can have a good discussion uh, regarding these questions. And I'm sure we'll bring in her assistant at some point as well. Yeah, the, I mean, the first thing that I wanted to ask you was, was there any of those pictures that you wanted viewers to see and that you wanted to talk about? Well, maybe you want to put one of those maps up again, just a little bit, uh, maybe like the 3D map. That one is kind of like a drawing. The other one's kind of more like a picture with some, you know, so, some art on it. Maybe we could take a look at that one uh, very quickly because it's, uh, I think it's, it's more like what we're used to in the 21st century. We actually get to see uh maybe the next one possibly doctor the next one there we go right there that's i think what we're used to seeing that almost reminds me of a google map uh picture now in the 21st century and what happened was they did have um i think a helicopter or i guess it would be a plane that went by and took a picture to um show you know the, the map or the path that this perpetrator took with Evelyn once he abducted her. So he comes out, you'll see it right down at the bottom of the screen and goes around. There was blood right there at spot number two. Then he made a curve and he gets out to that other street. There was a blood spot on number three. And then it seems that he went down the street. As you can see, there was more blood at um, point number four. You can see how close these houses are. I, I, one house there, that one in the left, uh, the upper left corner is what 50 feet away and then the, the garage for the other one is about 50 feet away and this guy seemingly was carrying Evelyn through all of this uh, you don't see that I don't know too often at least not in my experience at least when we talk about Janelle Matthews's uh, murder everybody seems to believe that she was just taken out of her house and taken to a car that was sitting on the street we obviously know that this is not the situation with Evelyn's disappearance, surely not. And, you know, distressingly, you don't like hearing about the, the finding of blood uh, at, at a variety of places. We, sh we know that uh, with each occurrence of, of seeing blood, that the odds of Evelyn surviving this get lower and lower and lower. So yes, uh, Dr. Telesco, I think that that picture, uh, uh, was a good one. Thank you for asking. Um, about what about that. this? What about this article? Yeah, that old tape could offer clues in Hartley case. Yeah, I, I, I gave, I sent it to you because this is once again one of those 
You never know when these kinds of things are going to be uh, pop up because you can see from the date, this didn't pop up on anybody's radar until 2004. So what was that? 50 years after she went missing. And this old tape, obviously it went nowhere. And Dr. Telesco, you are the police officer. You have the experience talking to uh, perpetrators, witnesses, and people like that. And I think you know, the longer you get away from a crime, the less likely, you know, any information that comes forward like this, the less likely it's going to be helpful, the less likely it's going to be true. What I would say, you know, it almost seems just, a, you know, a little too perfect. And we get that a lot in disappearances where people come forward just with just the perfect story right and then you find out that the perfect story doesn't go anywhere and then you start thinking whether that story was true or not obviously this tape exists but we've had that in other disappearances where people are allegedly saying things and you know you have to look at these things in the context of the conversation for all we know before this the tape recorder or whatever would have been at the time got pressed who knows what kind of entrapping the person was doing that was asking the questions we just don't know Right. So I'm always uh, very cynical, skeptical uh, about these types of things, unless you can hear an entire conversation. But it really has to be good for me to believe it. I, so I guess my my big question is in terms of the motive, you you had originally said that um, they were just it, it appeared as though they were just trying to get a way in. Right. And that yes. by going yes. into the in, through that window. Right. Um, could it have been a burglary gone bad? Could it have been um, someone knew she was in there? Uh, is that unlikely? What like? And I know that yeah. you don't theorize, and I know you don't like to do that. Well, we do a little theorizing here. I don't mind doing it here, but we certainly do not do that on the program. I don't let let the guests do it, and I don't do it. But the question is, was she targeted, or was it just bad luck? And even if we go move up to 1984 with Janelle Matthews. We're still not sure on that one either. I mean, there was a trial. I was part of that trial. Steve Pankey uh, was put on trial for the murder and the prosecutor tried to say that he went over for the express purpose of killing Janelle, but that was not proven. It was a hung jury. So we still have the same situation with, um, with Evelyn Hartley. Yes, on one hand, you could look at how the perpetrator was going from window to window to window uh, trying to pry one or the other open, meaning, you know, it does seem like he was trying to sneak into the house. Really, I guess the, the argument would be, well, if he really, really wanted to abduct Evelyn, you know, why didn't he just go up to the, the front door and knock on it? That's a very good question. But the, the answer might be, well, she might not answer it. She might look out the window and see him standing there and she doesn't know him. So she doesn't unlock the door or he's afraid that neighbors might see. There's a lot of counter arguments to that. But you certainly could look at the tampering with the windows and say, well, this is somebody that was trying to break into the house. But the bigger question is, there were no shades in this house. There were no blinds or anything like that. And the lights were on in the house. So what kind of burglar is going around a house, sees the lights are on, but still wants to get into that house? Would the lights themselves not have been enough to deter this person from breaking in? Obviously not. So then you have to start thinking, well, he didn't mind that the lights were on. Maybe then it actually was Evelyn or to go in this direction, we have to remember something going back to the facts of this disappearance. Not only were the Rasmussen's at this football game that night, but their regular babysitter was at the game that night. So we have to then open ourselves up to, well, yes, a guy or men went over to that house targeting the girl there, but actually they thought that the regular babysitter was going to be there and not Evelyn. So they got the steps and whoops, it's not Jane Doe, the babysitter. It's Evelyn Hartley, the babysitter. And they're like, oh no, oh no. Now, so here's here's my question as, a, as an investigator, right? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would be curious to know the background of both of these victims. Well, not the victim, Evelyn, of course, but then yeah. now you mentioned 
the real babysitter. Um, so maybe target, maybe target number one, and and Evelyn was not really, uh, you know, included in that in that original plan. Let's say. Right. So what do we know about that original babysitter, and what you do know, we know about Evelyn? Evelyn seemed to be just a great uh, girl. Uh, did well in school. Great family. Obviously, I mean, you know, she's 15 year old and, you know, she doesn't mind going to babysit for a family, even though the entire town is going to this football game. She's saying, you know what? No problem. I'll go babysit on a Friday night. That sounds like to me, like a very special teenager to me. You know, we were all teenagers once and I think we all wanted to go to the big football game. So I think that says something special about her that she would choose to do that. We know that she took her schoolwork with her. She sounds like a very conscientious 15 year old. But so could it I have to believe but, that there wasn't, you know, anything shady going on in her life, but, you know. But could it be also like that everybody knew that this big football game was happening and that, I mean, could it be that they like knew that already? And so they yes. really were targeting Evelyn. That, that certainly could be the case. Then the question is, well, how many people knew that she was going to be babysitting that night? I mean, it, she probably told some people. Maybe the Rasmussen's told some people. Not sure that we had have any information on that. And if we do, I mean, it's you know, it's again, right. this is the problem with disappearances. Once they get once they get to be this old, yeah. you know, I'm sure a lot of people were told, and I, I'm also probably sure that a lot of those people are deceased now. Right. Um, Did the investigators ever uh, question the original babysitter? They, they do. I, I really don't know. That was not in Anthony's work or anything that I could find to find out, but. Once again, would the Rasmussen's enlist a, this, the regular babysitter? Would they really have a, a girl that they didn't trust, you know, babysitting their infant? They must have known her. They must have known this family. They must have been very secure with the regular babysitter that this girl can take care of their, you know, new child. So, you know, I, I guess would have to lean toward the idea that maybe this other babysitter was kind of just like Evelyn was. So, um, but we don't have a lot of information right. out there regarding this, this other uh, babysitter. Now, this is a definite homicide. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I always like to get, uh, hold out hope, Dr. Telesco, but when you hear that she's 15, she would know what her name was and all of that. Uh, how could she be convinced to start a new life with somewhere with somebody else? Of course, we know that there was blood. We have to take for granted that it was hers, given that it was her blood type. It doesn't look good. Right. So like there are some other cases that we've talked about. I don't know how many cases we've uh, we've we've actually examined here. Mm -hmm. And I know how many cases, you know, you examine regularly, yeah. weekly. So, but this one really, really, to me, is, is foul play. Yeah. You know, once again, I always hold out hope. But whether uh, this she was targeted or whether this was just wrong place, wrong time, you know, foul play absolutely is not the number one choice. Uh, she's targeted for whatever reason or the other babysitter was targeted and was still a kind of wrong place, wrong time. They get in there, she sees them and they're like, she's not who we were looking for, but we're going to take her anyway. And I'll get to point number two in a moment because I think that is a little bit confusing too. Yeah. But, or they're breaking into the house because they're just inept and didn't realize that all these lights were on. They're going up the steps. They're going to steal stuff. And... There, there she is on the couch uh, doing her schoolwork. Now, we should say, as you, you know, seeing the, the, uh, the picture uh, with the map, the Rasmussen's did not live in a mansion. You know, they were not well off. Uh, they didn't live, you know, in you know, a huge lot with a gate around it and driving Rolls Royces. They were a middle class family. So if somebody's breaking into their house. Why? We, what are you going to get, especially Why? in 1953? Right. Maybe in the right. 21st century, you end up stealing a bunch of electronic equipment and game, you know, video game consoles and, and TVs and things. What exactly are you stealing in 1953? What is it about this family, though? What, is, what are they involved the, in? The Rasmussen, once again, seem to be just a regular family. As I remember it, I think 
Uh, Mr. Rasmussen was in, um, you know, you know, man of the community. They're married, going to the football game, taking place, you know, taking part in the community activity. For some reason, I thought that he might have been in education, but I might, I, I'm thinking maybe I'm thinking of Janelle Matthews' father who was involved in education, but not, not a shady family, uh, you know, no mafia connections or anything like that, no underhandedness yeah. that I've heard about. I know, once again, Anthony, the blogger who worked on this very hard, uh, anything, you know, from that standpoint, there were no, uh, there was no ransom demands, nothing like that, which, you know, sometimes do pop up in cases like this. But if I can move on to question yeah, number two. Move on to your second point. The second question that I have at the beginning, well, from the beginning is why would the perpetrator go out, out the way he came in with Evelyn? Now that we've seen that picture, you see that, that little window you have to imagine he takes Evelyn down into the cellar. How did he get her up that ladder and out that window? It could lead you to believe that more than one person was involved. So you could see one person go up the ladder, get outside. The second person kind of hoist her up by her waist or something. The guy grabs her arms, pulls her out, and then the second guy goes out and they all take off together. What this wouldn't explain though, is why it seems like the perpetrator maybe got tired or something at a couple spots and put her down on the ground where, where the blood was found. You would think that two guys would be enough to carry one 15-year-old girl, and Evelyn was not a, 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 a big girl. So why when they went upstairs, and or he went upstairs and discovered Evelyn there, whether she was tar targeted or not, why not just take her out the front door, go downstairs? It seems like once again, like the oddest of all choices. Uh, I don't think, you know, anybody looked at that situation would even think that you could even do that. Get a, a girl who maybe she got knocked out at this point, we don't know. But even if right. she was limp, that might even make her heavier because she's you yeah. know, just kind of flopping around. Right. So we just don't know, but we have to... Uh, keep in mind that there are signs that this might have been more than one perpetrator. Two guys got together to do this, maybe three, maybe four. But it, it, we also have to think about this was nighttime, probably could have gone out the front door, with, you know, and really not, you have to go outside, you have to go outside eventually anyway, if you're going to take her, wouldn't it just be easier to go right out the front door, but that's not what they did. So it's just, this is another thing that I, I'm not sure. I, I often talk about trying to attach logical, you know, uh, logical theories to illogical facts. We know they're facts, but they seem to contradict each other. Yeah. But we know they're facts. So what is it about? What is it that we don't know that might put those facts together to make them go together? Yeah. It's something we don't have in Evelyn's case because it doesn't make any sense that somebody would go out the way he came in, taking uh, a girl with him in this, you know, this little window. Let me ask you what we're looking at here. What are we looking at? That is a footprint uh, from a shoe that was found uh, outside of the Rasmussen house. And the police are very, 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 very sure that this is a footprint from the perpetrator. This could be paired with the picture we have of the shoes. And police seem to believe that that type of shoe made this mark, although there's no guarantee that the shoes they found were actually the ones that were worn by the perpetrator of this disappearance. But that is a footprint, and it was found right around the uh, Rasmussen house. And these are the shoes? Those are the shoes that they found uh, later. Once again, they were not like right down the street. They were a couple miles away. They were not close. Uh, but for some reason, they looked at them. They knew about the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley. They knew about this footprint. They put the shoes to the footprint or the shoe print and kind of um, convinced themselves that these are probably the shoes that were involved. I mean, what are the odds? I don't know how common these shoes were at the time. Uh, 1950s were looked before my time. But uh, if they're a unique shoe, then maybe the, the odds go up that these were the shoes worn by the perpetrator of this disappearance. And so he would have, so the, the theory is that he 
change his shoes. Yeah, he, he, didn't want, he didn't want the, you know, his shoes maybe had blood on. Did, was, was blood found on these shoes? Do we know? I think so. Yes. There yeah. Was blood found yeah. on that jacket that was her type. Once again, not her blood, her type. And well, we don't know if also, it was her was blood, also but it could have been, but it could, could be her blood, right? Could be. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Right. But what kind of put the shoes with this jacket that was found, there was some sort of metal shavings. There was something about both the shoes and this, this jean jacket that were found that they had some sort of powder on them or material or shavings or something embedded in the fabric that could make you think that the person who's wearing these shoes was also wearing these, this jean jacket, but the shoes and the jean jacket were not found in the same place. So th this all kind of connects, but once again, it's very circumstantial. I'm sure if they could do DNA now, if they have Evelyn's DNA, they could maybe, you know, get to, uh, you know, a closer conclusion to this. They might've done that, but of course they would not have to tell us the, the public uh, about that. And then finally, just to put this uh, in the context in which we live now in the 21st century, 2022, uh, we have to think how this disappearance would be different. We might have a, a doorbell camera, even though this person seemingly went through the, um, the basement, maybe we might get lucky, maybe not on the Rasmussen house, maybe on another house. And in fact, I've covered at least one disappearance where I uh, a camera on a doorbell ringer, whatever they call those these days, actually caught a missing person walking by. This case is still unsolved, but this camera actually caught this person walking by in a completely different house from where this person disappeared. We would know about Amber Alerts. As soon as her father would have showed up there uh, and she's not there, sees um, the, the, the furniture strewn all over the place. You know, he could have called 911 and an Amber Alert would have been generated immediately. Of course, that didn't start happening until the 1990s. DNA, we would be assured that the, the, the blood in the grass, the blood on the jacket, and anything else that was found in the house would all be tested. It might take some time, but we know that would get done. Of course, her being 15, she would have been on social media. We would know the last time that uh, she used her social media account. Maybe if the, the perpetrator didn't know that her phone was on her, we might have some ping information. It's, this is the kind of disappearance that would be so much different now. We can't say that about all these disappearances that happened before the 21st century. But this is one of those that we could be assured there would be a ton uh, of uh, more information for a disappearance like this, given where the missing person was, who the missing person was, uh, the age that she was, uh, all, putting that all together would generate a lot more information for a disappearance now. Yeah, I really appreciate that you did that, that you kind of uh, jettisoned us to the present day where we might yeah. have a little bit more uh, tools and techniques to be able to maybe get to the bottom of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you've got one of your viewers, and I, I think it's one of your followers, Screaming Skull Saloon. Yes. Who is this? I, I have to admit, I don't know this person's real name. They're probably going to be, I don't know if they're going to be offended by that, but they probably told me their real name at one time or another, but. Um, okay. Well, in any, in any event, um, he or she is saying, uh, I, and I think in regards to the shoes, that these were BF Goodrich Hood Mogul shoes. Mm -hmm. Those are the brand names. Yeah. Just like Air Jordans or uh, something like that. That was the name of them uh, at the time. Right. Yeah. And I don't know how odd they were, how unique they were. I don't, I, I really don't know that. I'm sure yeah. somebody uh, has looked that up. Some, I'm, I'm hoping some police officer investigator did that at the time. I don't have that information. Yes. Well, um, Screaming Skull Saloon, uh, that's his, that's his call letters here. Yeah. Um, has an awful lot of information about this case. Yeah. He's probably been, uh, he or she has probably been looking at Going back, because I told everybody would be doing this, might got, I might have gone back and listened to the episode I did with Anthony, maybe gone to his blog. And of course, we only have like an hour here. I just try to stick to the high points, but there's a, a ton of information. Uh, yeah. We've only probably hit on 50% uh, of it, but this is the big 50%. How it happened, the blood evidence, some of the things that popped up the shoes, 
the jacket, um, you know, all that information. Yeah. But I think it's the, the main highlights. Of course, there's a lot of informa- uh, interview, many interviews that her parents did. There were interviews that the Rasmussen's did. Um, I think eventually when the baby uh, grew up to be an adult, she has been interviewed. Um, you know, a lot of people have been talked to, both suspects, people connected to Evelyn, her family. A lot of people have been interviewed over the last 70 years. Yeah. And still it's, I, um, it's so funny because I wasn't actually monitoring the chat. I know that Brendan is, but mm-hmm. um, Twinkle, Twinkle Designs, that's uh, another, her, yes. another her, regular yeah. follower of ours yeah. um, and mostly of yours. Yeah. Uh, asked the same question that I asked about the original babysitter and wonder if the police had checked her out. But there's a, another interesting thing here. Um, they're really some of the, the chatter here is saying that it was probably a burglary. This is their theory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that the burglar happened upon Evelyn, didn't know there was a, a, also a toddler in her crib. I'm wondering if there was even a sexual assault. With Evelyn, uh, you know, if her remains were found, I don't even know how you'd prove that now, uh, 60 right. something. You know, I, I don't know how I would ever do that. It seems to me that, um, you know, you get the idea that this is something that happened very quickly and yeah. that if a sexual assault occurred, it might have occurred at a different location. Uh, I, I, as the listeners know, I don't argue with people about theories uh unless you know they're telling me that the person got beamed up to it you know a, a ufo right. all i try to do when i talk to listeners who contact me with theories and ideas is we just try to go through the facts and to make sure any theory that you come up with does not contradict the, the facts yes. now it very well may be that it was a burglary gone wrong we still then have to start to ask the question like well who would break into a house these other windows they were trying to be pried upon the lights were on in the house. The radio was on in the house. If somebody looked through a window, that person would have seen you with the book sitting there, the lights on, heard the radio, seen Evelyn sitting there. Probably it's dark. It's not like you, how, you know, when you're walking by a house in the daytime, you don't know if lights are on or, or not. This is nighttime. The lights would, you know, stick out as much as ever. Yeah. And still this I, person or pre- people chose to break into this house. I don't think that it's just one person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a given how they exited the house with Evelyn. I think that's a right. very good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We could certainly we could certainly see an idea where somebody knew that the Rasmussen's and the babysitter would be at the football game. And this person or people took for granted that the Rasmussen's would take being that the babysitter was going to be there that they thought the baby would also be with the Rasmussen's at the game. So they think, well, we can go over there, break into the house and maybe steal whatever. I don't even know what they would even think about stealing in a middle-class house. But then when they get there and the lights are on, they might've thought, well, they just left those lights on to scare people away. Maybe they just left the lights on. And for all we know, when they looked in the window, Evelyn might've been in the bathroom. And so they say, hey, nobody's inside. We can go in. Let's go break in through this window. And so she comes back, sits down on the couch, and all of a sudden she's looking two burglars right in front of her. Certainly yeah. possible. There are no facts to contradict that. But that takes a lot of things going, you know, imperfectly for it to happen. But it's still possible. It's, there are yeah. no physics that are being, um, laws of physics that are being broken by portraying that scenario. Yeah. Were there other points that you wanted to make before I bring our no, um, our wonderful criminal justice undergrad senior? Yes. Um, I think he's got a 3.8. I think wow. he's got a 3.8. He's not perfect. Grade point average. Uh, he's been now, um, he's now entered into Alpha Phi Sigma. He was given that honor of Alpha Phi Sigma, which is uh, the Criminal Justice Honor Society. Uh, he's already been accepted into a master's program in Massachusetts. Let's see, what else can I say about him? He's the president of the Sociodrama Club Stage for Change that just was nominated as a finalist for what we call at NSU a Stewie Award. So, I mean, this guy is a mover and a shaker, believe me. It's just so disgusting, Dr. Blatt. It's, it's it is disgusting. Bad. It is disgusting, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he's also good looking too. So he's like mm-hmm. the whole package. Come on, come on, uh, Brendan. 
come on the air here and uh, give us a question. Let me spotlight you so everybody could see. <laughs> I'm like the proud grandparent, you know? Well, thank you, Dr. T, for that great introduction. And uh, thank you for being here with us tonight, Ed. Um, first off, I just wanted to go off one of the questions we had from one of our viewers, uh, another one from Twinkle Designs. Yeah, um, that I found really fascinating. Did did Evelyn have a boyfriend or maybe an ex boyfriend or anyone like known you know, like that? I don't have that in my notes uh, to talk about that. Um, you know, she's fifteen. Uh, probably got to believe that maybe something was going on, uh, but I, I just it's not was not something that stuck out to me as I was uh, putting my notes together for this case. Uh, it's probably all of us know that ex boyfriends, ex husbands are always a good choice when it comes to the disappearances uh, of women. You know, what I would say to Twinkle, and I know Twinkle, I've talked to her many times, what I would say to her is that if this was a, an ex-boyfriend or something, why didn't you just come up to the front door, even whether he was an ex or, or a boyfriend or not? Mm -hmm. have to think about that. I, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, that kills the question or anything, but it's something we have to think about. How do we Absolutely. know that he didn't do that? Because we know that somebody broke in through the uh, the window and went in and out through that window. That's how we know. I mean, how do, maybe we, know, how do we know when they went in? They didn't just come out that window. How do we know that? Um, because we know that those other windows were pried open and the door was locked. I mean, what did they do and lock the door behind them on the way out? The key? Maybe. Maybe. But uh, all I can tell you, the police at the time uh, surmised that somebody was trying to break into the house and they found a way to do this through a particular window. Good. Brendan, any, any questions that you might have? Yeah, absolutely. Just one final question. Um, I know with the, the shoes being in different, the, her shoes being in different places in the house, um, the glasses being broken, that there was obviously some kind of a struggle yeah. um, along with the blood that may or may not have been hers in the basement. Yeah. Do the, did the police have any theories as to where she might have sustained these injuries, whether it was just a physical struggle or whether a weapon was involved or anything like that? Then nothing about a weapon, no weapon was found anywhere. Although once again, they found the shoes, they found these other things that could be connected to her disappearance, but there were no weapons, no like a tire iron or a gun or a knife or anything that, that was ever found that had her blood type on it. At least not, nothing that they've ever released publicly over the last 69 years. Uh, but that's a very good question. And I have to tell you that when I start hearing about uh, blood, and, and you should know, the listeners should know, the viewers should know if they don't listen to Unfound uh, yet, but they should be doing so, that we rarely talk about blood being left behind and, and being a source of uh, a clue in disappearances. Very, very rare. So I don't have a lot of experience in that area, but I will tell you that when I hear about something like that, I start thinking about a head injury because if it was a bodily injury, I'm thinking the clothes might cover it up to the point that maybe if she was bleeding, it wouldn't start to soak through until well after being outside the house or something. That's how I think about it. I start thinking about, well, you know, what kind of injuries are you going to sustain that, um, you know, are going to bleed, you know, from your skin or something. Yeah, if it's a sharp object, a knife, a machete or something, then sure. But, you know, if it's a burglar who's going in there and thinks that the house is empty, then, you know, a lot of burglars don't even have uh, a weapon on them because they know if they get caught with a weapon, that really ups the charges. So, um, you know, we have to think about that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you for all your help tonight. Of course. And um, any closing, closing thoughts, Ed? Uh, Evelyn's is uh, a disappearance that continues, um, you know, to, to get my attention because it's always it's always going to be interesting when you're trying to find out was a person did a person go missing because they were targeted or did the person go missing because they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time and i even have a couple other disappearances that we've covered where we could think about that uh regina marie boss who was a, uh, an adult woman who went missing approximately 20 years ago from from nebraska she was a musician she had gone to play at an open mic night she had gone back out to her car then never came home when they found her car in the parking lot, 
the trunk of the car was was the, the guitar she was playing was in the car so she had gotten to her car but the trunk of her car was not closed and to this day still unsolved 20 years later we still don't know if it was a guy who she knew who followed her out to her car and did something or did somebody some deviant just happening to drive by, happening to drive by when she was going to her car do something to her all right, that's one. Dale Kerstetter's uh, disappearance from 1987 in Bradford, Pennsylvania. Once again, it's a little bit different in that we don't know if he, he was a security guard at a glass plant. Somebody broke into the plant to steal platinum. He went, he, the, the platinum got stolen and he went missing. And so we don't know, was he in the wrong place at the wrong time? Just happened to be the security guard that night. Or was he actually a part of the theft? And could it be that he and this burglar, this thief, were working together to steal this platinum, then, then you know, sell it and get the proceeds from it, and then his partner double-crossed him? So we run in this, not a lot, but once in a while we will run into a disappearance where it's two really different choices that you have in mind. We know that the person went missing, but was the person targeted or were they just uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time? And oftentimes it's very, very difficult to determine just like it is for Evelyn's disappearance. Well, we're out of time. Um, it's always the hour goes by like that. Um, well, yes. Tell us about your next show coming up, not with us, but your mm -hmm. show. Okay, tomorrow uh, I'm covering, uh, the, covering the disappearance of Sue Swedell from Lake Elmo, Minnesota. Uh, speaking of being targeted, um, she was a girl who was at work. This is a disappearance from 1988. On the way home, her car overheated uh, in a blizzard. She pulled into a gas station. Not long after that, a car pulled in behind her. She got into that car and was never seen again. When her car was eventually examined because they, she had told the gas station attendant there before she got picked up, you know, there's something wrong with my car. That's why I stopped here. Uh, they found out that her car had been tampered with. That while she was at work, somebody had gone into the engine bay and, uh, and um, fiddled with the radiator so that it would drain out all its coolant. So it overheats on the way home, she pulls in and then somebody picks her up and she's never seen again. So we're covering that disappearance tomorrow on Unfound. Uh, her sister, Christine, her younger sister by three years will be the guest. She did a fantastic episode. The episode's over two hours long, a lot of uh, information, certainly uh, some facts in that uh, that are unique to her disappearance that I'm not gonna talk about now. Everybody should just listen to it tomorrow. Good. So that's tomorrow. And um, like it stated, stated at the beginning, uh, I'm very excited to be a part of the Spotify family. Now we're going to be monetizing the program. And uh, so it's going to lead uh, to, I think, a lot more opportunities. I'm sure it's going to make Unfound even more popular than it is. Excellent. Excellent. And so, you know, one of these days we're going to want me and Brendan are going to want one of those <laughs> Unfound T-shirts. We're working on that. <laughs> okay, very it's good. Been a, uh, it's been a point of contention right now. There's so many things to do. And I have an assistant who is in charge of that, but she's been going through some things. And we've just been concentrating <laughs> on some other things now, but it's on the agenda for this year. Um, we want to get the merchandising of the program in a better place. It's a very uh, large inefficiency in our process right now, but um, we're working on it. Good, 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 good. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to tell um, <clears throat> all of a sudden <clears throat> I got no water and I have dust in my throat. <clears> throat> wow. <clears throat> and Brendan is too far away <clears throat> to bring me any water. But I'm wondering if Brendan might be able to tell the viewers <clears throat> about upcoming programming that we're having. I know we have something um, on March 9th and March 10th that I think they might be interested in. Absolutely. So 
from 12 to 1 on March 9th, uh, the Socio Drama Club that me and Dr. Telesco are part of will be hosting a online Zoom event called Behind the Mask. Um, it'll be on child predators and uh, kind of like how social media and the technology age links into that. Also on this channel on March 10th at 7 p.m., we'll have um, forensic examiner Sharon Plotkin on here for a program similar to this live on YouTube. And then for all the Unfound fans who are here with us tonight, uh, March 31st at 7 p.m., that's a Thursday, on this channel we'll have Ed with us again. So please wow. be on the lookout for that. Great. I didn't even know that till right now. I'm excited. I'm already excited. I didn't even know right. that. That's right. I don't know. I stopped choking, so I'm good. Thank you, Brendan, <laughs> for taking that. And April 28th, too. So mark your calendar, March 31st, Fantastic. April 28th. If that's good for you, Fantastic. Ed, yes, Thursdays that's are when we're going to do our next on Found. And yeah, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel mm -hmm. and um, and hit the bell for notifications yeah. when, we, when we go live. So um, again, thank you. To both of you, thank you, Ed, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on our show. And um, don't forget, Fishler College of Education School of Criminal Justice, if you look in the chat, you're going to see a lot of stuff about our uh, undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral programs. So we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you.